Good evening. <laughs> Thank you all for coming this evening. I'm Lisa Wheeler. I'm the Director of Curatorial Services at the Booth Museum. That means we handle a lot of art. <laughs> a lot. Um, I'm filling in for our director, Seth Hopkins. Um, he he's always tends to overbook, and he had three other, well, three engagements total this evening, and he's currently speaking over at the Rotary Club um, at Big Canoe, so he apologizes for not being here. <laughs> um, I'd like to start by welcoming Beverly and John McNeil. Yeah, would y'all stand or wave or? <laughs> <laughs> They're the reasons we um, have the Portraits of Hope or were able to have it here on view at the booth. It was Beverly's idea, her brainchild, and um, John is CEO at the Love Lady Center, and that's where most of the, the portraits are from, women who have succeeded and graduated from there. Um, I'm, I want to just share a, a few announcements. We have tons of stuff going on, but to me, our speakers this evening are way more important than announcements, so I just want to speed through a couple. We've got a new Writers Guild that is opening. Um, it's a new distinguished uh, songwriter series, and it starts on Monday, March the 12th at 2. It'll be in here in the theater. It will be hosted by musician Scott Thompson, and the first featured songwriter is Tony Arada, from Nashville, and you may not recognize his name, but he wrote the song The Dance and a whole lot more <laughs> successes after that one. Um, the series is open to everyone. If you are a Guild Writers Guild member, your ticket is $5. If you're a Booth member, it's 10 And if uh, it's public, you need to join the booth, but if you insist on just being general public, it's gonna cost you $15, so please come. Then we have two exhibit openings this month. One is our middle and high school student exhibit. It opens in the Borderlands Gallery um, next week on Tuesday. And uh, the reception is five to seven on March the 16th. Then our, our next exhibit um, in one of the temporary galleries is Many Metals, Many Fires, Strauss, Ivy, and Rogers. And it opens for members on Saturday the 25th. There will be gallery walks, a reception, a lecture um, between four and seven. And this is not your, you know, exhibit of bronze, of cast bronze sculptures. This is gonna be the most unique and unusual metalworks show that, that we have ever, ever had here. So um, it, will, it will challenge your brain. So <laughs> please come and see it. Um, I do see some of our museum members in the audience, but if you are not a member, please see our membership manager, Shanna Smith. She's, she's taking the seat so she can trap you as you go out, if you look on this side. Please see her or uh, stop by the front desk to, to sign up because the events here are wonderful and you don't want to miss any of them. Now, I'd like to introduce our um, first special guest this evening, I was, uh, he sent, um, a, you know, a Vita and, and the resume and all that, and I, I, it's, I like, I don't feel like I should be the one doing the introduction, like it needs to be, I don't know, some, some dignitary, you know, to, that here giving this intro this evening, and I am going to trim it a bit, but <laughs> our speaker this evening was raised on a Kansas farm and became a scientist inventor, professor, entrepreneur, and author. He has a PhD in molecular biology and has served in leadership positions in the pharmaceutical and biomedical industry. He was among the youngest recipients of a prestigious endowed chair position. His professional accomplishments include 80 scientific articles, 15 issued patents, and numerous professional awards. He has invented and commercialized biomedical products such as Panex drugs for anxiety, and he has founded several biomedical companies. He has a diverse set of 
perspective seldom provided by others. He passionately addresses issues from a biblically-based kingdom of God worldview and firsthand perspectives as one accustomed to genuine faith defined as risk-taking belief in action. He is the author of four Judeo-Christian books, Praying Faith, Hope When Everything Seems Hopeless, Half Truth or Lies, and Pain Taught Me to Love. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Tom Dooley. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here. I uh, have for many years frequented the uh, Northwest Corridor coming out of Georgia, and today I had the great privilege of bypassing your traffic and just taking local roads from Alabama, and that's the smart move. If you're from Alabama, you want to avoid that, and those of you who live here, you know that. So, um, I've been asked tonight to speak on a topic that at face value is a really sad, disheartening topic. I'm going to be real with you. I'll be candid with you. Uh, this, is not a, um, this is not a real joy-filled talk, but what I want to do tonight is I want to surprise you at the end of the talk and show you how you can take the darkest moments of your life and to turn it around and bring something redemptive and good out of something that's terrible. So hang in there. Uh, the initial uh, start of the talk really addresses confronting premature deaths due to overdoses, and in most cases those are opioid overdoses recently, as well as suicides. And um, the perspectives I bring will be that of a father uh, dealing with this as a scientist, as an inventor of drugs, um, and also as one who's very interested in pastoral um, ministry and teaching and helping the next generation along. So I'm bringing three different perspectives to bear. And uh, so let's start with that. Um, and let me first introduce to you the reason that I'm speaking tonight. Um, my son Thomas died in 2017. And here you see three photos. Um, on the left is a young boy. Uh, then he's the guy with the goatee um, right there, uh, attending his eldest brother's wedding. And here he is with his eldest brother in uh, Brooklyn, having a coffee shortly before he died. Um, so how did my son die? Um, well, as an adolescent, Thomas uh, developed obsessive compulsive disorder. He had two key manifestations of that. If he came into a room, he would count chairs, count light bulbs, count not the number of people in the room. So he had a, uh, an, an urge to always count things. And he also had a concern with germs and those meaning that he, he couldn't prepare food without gloves. He had to be very careful about his hands in particular. And the irony is his room was a typical, you know, boy's mess. Uh, so his, his room was filthy, but he was concerned about his hands. And so he developed that as a young boy. The first sign that my wife and I had of something was really wrong was I would go beat on the bathroom door and I'd say, man, you're in there taking a shower for a long time, you know? We only have so much hot water in this house and we have a full household of people that need to take a bath, you know, get out of there. Well, we didn't realize that he had already started cleansing rituals where he had to repetitively bathe over and over. And, and he developed an internal sense of guilt and shame about that, never told us about it, never explained it. We didn't know what was going on. We just knew something was up. Um, eventually, we had a, a major blow up um, took him to a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist diagnosed him with OCD and uh, immediately put him on benzodiazepine drugs. They're fast-acting anti-anxiety medicines such as Klonopin or Xanax. Everybody in the room's heard the name Xanax. Uh, it's that class of drugs. Put it on him, and what happened then was throughout his high school years, 
he became like a zombie. They just put him to sleep. He'd, he'd go to class. He was a brilliant kid, capable of straight A's and above and beyond. Uh, it could have, could have done anything he wanted in life. He was very bright, very creative. Um, and yet he would just go to, go to class and he would sleep for like six hours. He would just put his head on, on his forearms and rest in classroom. And uh, sometimes he would ring me up. And some of my worst memories, he'd call me up and he'd say, Dad, come get me, come get me. And I would hop in the car, I'd rest to the high school, and I'd pick him up and I'd say, what were you thinking about today? And he said, Dad, I have these intrusive thoughts. They play over and over and over like a squirrel cage that's running around in my head of just horrible things. He said, I would just see somebody. I'd see their face in the next scene. I'd see something terrible about them. And he said, I can't stay here. Take me home. So his OCD was very severe. Uh, and the benzodiazepines didn't help. They just kind of turned him into a zombie. Then later, he went to an oral surgeon. He had his wisdom teeth pulled. And for the first time, received something like Percocet, Endocet, one of these opioid drugs. And I later learned from him, he said, that sufficiently addressed his OCD to where he said, I felt normal. I didn't have racing thoughts in my head. I felt like I could function like a normal human being. And so then he secretly sought out opioids and eventually became, uh, eventually uh, ended up moving into street opioids. He transitioned from his prescriptions to the street opioids and eventually uh, became addicted to uh, fentanyl. And then, uh, on Groundhog Day, how ironic. So the next time you experience Groundhog Day, remember my family. Because on that day, that, on that morning, um, I found my son dead in a chair in the basement of our house. And he had overdosed on fentanyl in a combination with heroin. And he had been sick leading up to that the prior week, and the doctor had prescribed tramadol, which is also an opioid. And um, thus began one of the worst seasons of my life. Um, I had already gone through a chapter with him of really uh, nursing him back to life in uh, 2015. He was at uh, in Tuscaloosa, and. He had an overdose, a very serious overdose, where he developed a condition called rhabdomyolysis. He was essentially unconscious for 16 hours laying on the floor next to a room full of boys who were partying for 16 hours, and nobody found him. And uh, he probably should have died, and a combination of amazing prayer and amazing medical care brought him back to life. Um, but I've spent the next six months of my life uh, trying to nurse him back to health so he could use his arm, he could walk again, uh, he could function, uh, get, get, get ready to be employed again. It was a horrible season. And uh, then we get to 2017 and he passed. So, next slide. <clears throat> so let me first address this. If you have family members who have lost, um, if you're a family member who has lost a, a child or a brother or a sister or, and you faced uh, this current opioid crisis or suicide crisis, I want to kind of give you some perspective. These are my take-home points about what it's like to process the grief. It's horrible. Um, when my son died, I, for about three months, every single day, I bawled every day. I just bawled and bawled and bawled. And you'd say, well, why? I mean, you know, can't you suck it up and, you know, just be a man, do, you know. Well, the reality is, to the extent you love someone, that's to the extent that you grieve for them. And I love my son dearly, and I didn't want this tragedy to befall him. Uh, the second thing that becomes very clear to you is that death is final for them, for those who uh, have committed suicide or overdosed and died but it persists long-term for you. Um, their death is a final act. It's binary for them, but it's not for you. And when this becomes noticeable is that you have a funeral service and people send their regards and they send you food and they send you cards. But that doesn't last very long. That's a very short season. 
And then you're left in this season of acute, gut-wrenching, sleepless nights and horrible grief. And it just feels like it's never going to end. And it can last for some individuals for weeks, some months, some years. And the pace is individual. Uh, for me, that horrible acute phase lasted until the day that I walked into the Love Lady Center as a guest speaker. And that was almost four months after my son died. Uh, just a horrible, horrible phase. So you have this progression from acute mourning to a season of chronic mourning. And then it persists indefinitely. And that's also tied into this notion of uh, it's long term. Uh, we still have moments, my wife and I, and, and uh, we still have moments where we just go, what a shame, you know, what a shame. And you just go, why did, this, why did this have to happen? Why was my son living in the season where fentanyl was so readily available? Uh, you know, perhaps if he had had some other drug of choice, it would have had a different outcome. But we live in today. Um, and then lastly, and let me tell you this story. So at the funeral, my daughter, um, so at the funeral, my, my daughters, my two daughters, Catherine and Jeanette and I, we all spoke at his funeral and we eulogized uh, my son and their brother and the, the two of them did a beautiful job. And after the funeral that night, my daughter was just with me at the house and she just kept saying, oh, dad, but we could have gotten the drugs away from him. We could have gotten the paraphernalia away from him. We could have done more and we could have just woulda, coulda, shoulda. And I looked at her and I said, I said, Jenna, for every thought you have like that, there are a thousand thoughts of the wonderful things you did to try to keep him alive. Don't lose sight of all the good. You know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater here because you did everything in your power to try to help steer your son, you know, your brother, my son, to a better outcome. So how did this opioid crisis come to America? Um, well, the use of opium uh, was common in the 19th centuries. Uh, there were no government regulations, there was no FDA, and you could do whatever you wanted. Um, and then, Drug dealers began to promote heroin as a common uh, drug of choice in the 1960s through the 1980s. And around the latter part of that, uh, big pharma companies uh, started to develop prescription opioids that had very high potency, that exceeded that of, uh, of heroin. And they, they developed new classes of drugs above and beyond what was already out there, including fentanyl. So fentanyl was made to treat patients who have uh, really acute pain from, say, trauma, car accident, orthopedic surgery, and or uh, end-of-life care. So let's say you're, you, you've got somebody that's got very severe bone pain from metastatic cancer and the, it, nothing else seems to work, so they give them fentanyl patches. Let me say, the way it was invented was wonderful. It was, a great, it was a great concept. The scientists and the clinicians did great with it, but what's happened is the street has perverted its original intent. So then these pharma companies, and many of you have heard the name Purdue Pharma, there are other drug companies, and also drug distributors that are tied into this, um, uh, Purdue was one of the first, and there are many videos online that will tell you about this. They started to promote the use of prescription opioids for long-term treatment. Never intended for that, and yet they, they sort of breached from do it acutely for intense pain for, say, a week or two into let's do it month after month after month, year after year after year, and they produced a, a, an initial crisis, and yet there was no evidence to support their claims that these products were safe. None at all. And for some reason, the FDA bought their arguments, accepted their rationale, and it got through. And then it sort of became grandfathered in under approvals. Then we see step five, physicians and pill mills arise. And there are a lot of movies on TV now about these pill mills in Florida and West Virginia and all over. 
where somebody sets up a clinic and the entire profit motive is, is, is everything. They're, it's just about making a buck. They just open a door, hang up a sign and say, do you have pain? You walk in the door, the doc meets you and in about a two minute assessment says, oh, what's your ailment? And they write it on a pad saying, okay, back pain, knee pain. You can say whatever, they might do an x-ray, they might not uh, to sort of validate that claim. And then they, they walk them to the next room where they then are a dispensing agent and they'll sell the drug on the site, typically for cash to the person. So it basically became a legal loophole in prescribing uh, legal medicines to individuals that essentially were coming there because of their addiction. And, and it drove the addiction and kept driving it. Another thing that happened is there was dose escalation where people would start on a certain dose of the medicine and then they would prescribe them higher and higher and higher and higher doses of the same med because the body becomes tolerant to the lower dose and it needs its demand set point gets higher and higher over time. So these two things were confounding variables. And then we see a shift from prescription opioids to street opioids and eventually fentanyl hit the streets. And fentanyl has been a problem in the United States now for probably about the last decade, but it's really prominent in the last, I'd say in the last seven years, quite prominent. So that this year we'll have 100,000 people die of drug overdoses in the United States. And 70% of them are due to this one active ingredient. So there are about 70,000 people in the United States in this calendar year will die of this. So think of going to a big professional NFL game, you know, a big stadium, you know, Tennessee Titans, Kansas City Chiefs, whatever. Pick your stadium, fill it up, and kill that many people every year. So it's a really serious crisis that needs, needs attention. Very complex uh, condition. Obviously, it's not just a condition that's bad, but it's, it's an entire weave, uh, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a network of issues that are interrelated. We have a large number of overdose deaths at the top. It's in part a function of pain management, which we need. People have acute and chronic pain, they need to be managed uh, well, but in some cases, they, people go from their docks and they go to the streets. We have a, a tremendous rise in problems of, of depression and anxiety. So the mental health aspects of this are drivers as well. And this then brings them to becoming um, dependent upon opioids and often also benzodiazepines for the treatment of anxiety. We have another problem and that's really dysfunctional relationships in society. Our society is now, I'm a moralist, so I, and I happen to be the guy who got invited here today to speak, so I'm just telling you, our society is crumbling at the seams, and we're not keeping pace. Um, one of the things that I often told my son is as a saying of King Solomon, and it says, he who walks with wise men grows wiser, but the companion of fools suffers harm. And I kept telling my son, if you hang out with fools, you are one. You hang out with idiots, you are one. They're not, they're not the problem, you're the problem because you're associated with them. And so I've tried over the years to, to bring a sense of discipline and maybe moralistic discipline to my son and to some extent it helped, but not entirely. Um, along with this, the COVID crisis over the last several years has driven this up into steroid land. So we have tremendous uh, amount of uh, problems with anxiety and depression as well from COVID. Then at the bottom, you'll see issues related to recovery of which there are many approaches. And you'll see in my subsequent slides, I'm a firm believer and an advocate for all hands on deck. Don't criticize an approach, all right? Just don't. Raise your hand and say, good for you, good for you, good for you. You're faith-based, wonderful, go do it. You're not faith-based, wonderful, do it. Whatever works, do it. And, and I'll discuss that a little more uh, later. We have problems with su suppliers and access. Most of the fentanyl that's coming into the United States is being synthesized in China. But let me say this, 
The problem of fentanyl is not over, and it will be replaced by something like it or worse than it. It is yet to come. And I happen to know there are other active ingredients out there that are more potent than fentanyl that will make it into our, our society, and it's very difficult for a high-potency drug to be blocked in the U.S. mail or to be blocked at borders because it doesn't take very much of it to sneak it into the country. A tiny amount of it uh, can cause, cause havoc. And then lastly, we have the issue of justice and incarceration, which from my point of view, I don't even address it. It's like, eh, too late. Um, we've got all these other issues that lead up to it. We have an opioid slash mental health relationship that's important as well. So mental health disorders, by this I mean depression, mood disorders, and anxiety, uh, they will increase the likelihood that somebody takes prescription opioids. Adults with mental health, uh, here we go, this line, mental health disorders receive 51% of the opioid prescriptions. That's, that's a startling statistic, but it's true. In addition to that, the standard of care drugs that are used to treat anxiety themselves are part of the problem. The benzodiazepines are also another problem. And the FDA over the last, uh, since about, uh, let's see, eight years, has begun to address this because there's this problem of opioids that are used to treat pain, benzodiazepines that are used to treat anxiety. And what do you do in a patient who has pain and anxiety? It's a, it's a real dilemma. So the street drugs that are hurting our young folks today, they're high-potency synthetic opioids. They're made by chemists and labs, and in this case, typically made in China. They enter either through the mail, uh, through the dark web channels, or they can come uh, smuggled in cars or you know, through carriers and individuals coming in from, say, Mexico. And unlike former heroin drug dealers of, say, the 1970s, drug dealers today, they no longer cut their drugs to dilute their potency, to reduce their effectiveness. Drug dealers today want to make their products more potent, and they intentionally want to cause people to die or have overdoses. Not to die, but to overdose, because it's a statement of street credibility that my stuff is good. I've heard this firsthand from opioid drug dealers. This is the way they see it. You want to prove that your stuff works? How many people have overdosed under your, in your supply chain? It's a really sick. It's total sociopathic logic. And I've even had, I've had these individuals look me straight in the eye and tell me, I'm a sociopath and I really don't care. I'm apathetic. If the people die, they die because it was their choice to take it. So we've got that a problem happening as well. And added to it, modern technologies, mobile phones, internet, makes it very easy to access the products. Then uh, the opioids on the street, what's the real issue? One would think, who's not prone to taking opioids, that the driver is people want to get high. They take it to get high. They want to experience a good time and feel elation. That's not the reason they're taking it. They're taking it because they're trying to avoid the downside. So it's the opposite of that. It's once they become dependent, chemically dependent on an opioid, the withdrawal symptoms are horrible and they'll last for three days and they're gut-wrenchingly bad and they feel like they're going to die. And so it's avoidance of withdrawal is the main driver that keeps the engine moving forward. It's not getting high. Um, habitual use can damage their brain. I know that I know this. Uh, my son had CAT scans done on his, he had scans done on his brain and the neurologist said, sir, were you aware that your son has lesions in his brain? I said, well, I am now. Uh, he said, well, these lesions are the spots on the brain that are affected whenever somebody takes either an opiate or ecstasy. And I said, okay, understood. Um, and you can quote me on this. We've never in history had a more effective way to kill off our own people than with the high potency opioids like fentanyl. This is a history making paradigm shift. We've never had this. We didn't have this with alcohol or cocaine or methamphetamine. We have never had something like this. 
it's totally different. It's a game changer and it's a disappointing game change. Now, what are the causes of drug addiction and, and suicidal ideation? And I put the two together. Um, I've just, uh, I recommend a book at the end by a man named uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Sleeth. And in, in his book, he couples these because he said both of them have in common a disregard for living. So a person who gets involved in opioid addiction has a disregard for maintaining their life, as well as somebody who has suicidality, and there, there's a coupling here. So why do they do it? Uh, they do it because, let me back up, they want to seek uh, to de, you know, suppress their depression primarily, and sometimes it's anxiety. In my son's case, it was OCD. Um, many of the individuals have had uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse, mental abuse, and in the Love Lady Center, for instance, um, my guess, and I've never done a stats on it, maybe 80% of the women there will self-report this. This is very common. It's one of the bedrock principles that cause women to move into uh, drug addiction. Poor choice of relationships, immaturity, rebellion, foolishness, that's childishness. Um, gateway drug use, and this can be proven scientifically, there are three of them. And if you want to ask who ends up becoming a candidate for more serious drug abuse, it's these three in any combination. And many people would say, huh, I didn't know that. Well, it's true. Nicotine, alcohol, and or marijuana in some combination are predictive. Um, then there are perceptions of, of worthlessness, shame, and loneliness, a sense of isolation, that society doesn't care for me and you become apathetic and, and withdrawn. There are attempts to escape that hopelessness. And there's also a dear, deep spiritual principle. I teach this at the Love Lady Center. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. And, and I believe that there's a spiritual force behind a lot of the darkness herein. It's not just mental and biochemistry, although that's important. There's also uh, spiritual darkness at play. And lastly, electronic media. I read something this week that said that the average young person today spends seven hours a day on something electronic. Seven hours a day. Gaming, cell phone, internet, seven hours a day. Something's wrong. I mean, our society's messed up. We're just messed up. So, once again, all hands on deck. How do we prevent loss? The, one of the greatest predictors of whether somebody um, can stave off suicidal, suicidal thoughts is whether they have a belief in God or not. This is scientifically established fact. So a belief in God, I'm not defining God here, the concept, but belief in God is highly effective and it's one of the most effective ways of, of preventing uh, suicide. So there's a role for churches and synagogues to be involved in this. Obviously, residential recovery centers, I'm a firm advocate for that. Uh, I see firsthand experience of it. I wish my son had been willing to do that. We ple were pleading with him, saying, why don't you go into a 90-day program or a nine-month program? And he was kind of, uh, no, self-confident, bold, I can handle it. I, you know, I know what I'm doing, and uh, he just wouldn't do that. Eventually, though, he, he did agree that he would go to Narcotics Anonymous meetings, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, step programs like AANA or Celebrate Recovery, any kind of step program is bring it on, you know. If that works for that individual and keeps them, keeps them healthy longer, wonderful. As an individual, you have, each of us in the room has this ability, and it's the emotive skill set of ears and tears. Every one of us in the room could do this. Ears and tears. Listen to their story and ask them questions. And if you suspect somebody is, has suicidal ideation, ask them a couple questions, such as, are you thinking of harming yourself? And number two, have you started to make a plan for that? These are real simple questions. But ask them, you know, where are you at in this? Or, you know, you seem depressed or blue. Where are you in this? In this? And then take some action based on that. Then... We also have seen great success from Narcan used in rescuing 
um, opioid overdose victims. My son was Narcan back to life, and I'm grateful for it. It gave us more time to be with him, and uh, I'm a firm advocate of Narcan. And another one is Suboxone. Suboxone, there are very good studies that show that opioid addicts, people who have opioid use disorder, very, very frequently will go back in and relapse. It's, it's about 80%. It's really high. Suboxone will mute that. So I'm, I'm an advocate for Suboxone as well, and if your center permits it, go for it. <laughs> now, um, uh, other areas of, of, that are relevant, counseling by psychologists and medications by psychiatrists for treating mood disorders or anxiety conditions. Next up would be drug courts rather than long-term incarceration. Drug courts can be used favorably. We need to do all that we can to convince an individual not to hang out with the fools in their life and leave them behind. And also provide them with job preparedness and employment skills so that they have something meaningful in their life and get them off the street and get them, get them back in um, a better, you know, in a better uh, frame of mind. And this one, if I, if I could tell you one thing to take home, it's sufficient sleep. Of all the things that we can do and that we can strive for, this one is really simple and it is effective. Routine sleep and sufficient sleep is a wonderful way of keeping people alive because very frequently their sleep patterns are disturbed. They're up all night. They, they, they might sleep for an hour here or there. And so this is a really important feature. And provide resource lists to the community. I serve on, in Vestavia Hills in Birmingham, I've served on a commission there. And one of the first actions we did was we pulled all the resources of the Birmingham metro area together and we created documents that said, well, what are you looking for? What do you need? And I can tell you as a parent, the last thing you want to do is know that you need to take your child into a psychiatric hospital and not knowing how do I do this? How do I get them in there? And just trust me, it's horrible. It's a horrible experience for a parent to do this. And you don't have the resources, you don't know who to talk to, and you know, just going to the phone book doesn't help. So collecting resources is, is valuable. So let me transition and tell you a little bit about the, the Love Lady Center. I'm delighted to have our chairman and, and his lovely wife here tonight. They're the reasons that I was given the privilege to speak. Uh, the Love Lady Center is a, is a fascinating place. It's, on the, it's near the Birmingham airport. We have about 400 women there that are in recovery for a variety of reasons, but it's the nation's largest faith-based recovery center. Um, it was started by Brenda Spann, who's right there, and some of you have met her here. Brenda Spann was the, the, uh, really the motivator, the entrepreneur behind starting this center, and she started with women who were incarcerated first, and then the program has expanded to include a lot of folks that have substance use disorders. We have about 400 women, and it's a whole way house. It's not a halfway house. Our view is holistic, A to Z. What do they need? Let's impart that to them. Um, most of them have historic trauma of some type. When I teach there, and I'm a volunteer there every Monday, um, again, maybe 80% of those women will tell me their assault histories or stories and how they were you know, burned by their boyfriend or whatever. And, and I'll also say this, this is important to know. I've taught now more than a thousand women, most of whom have had opioid problems or meth problems, some have had alcohol problems. And when I, when I ask them, explain how you got here, there, there are two common denominators. One of them is this notion of historic abuse and trauma. The second is men. Now, I'm just, honest. So I have the privilege of being a dad and also uh, having suffered a son who died from this. And I just, I just come alongside of them. I give them a hug and I let them tell their story and we just sort of have a cry together. So part of what we need to do is as men, we need to own this. Many, many, many of the women who become addicted got there because of the men 
They were doing something to please the men in their life. And I see this pattern over and over and over. Every week I'm there, I, I hear stories like this. Then, um, so the, the, we have no government financing. It's essentially faith-based as well as we have programs that are uh, thrift stores, two very large big box store thrift stores, and we use that to generate, I don't know, John would know, maybe half of our revenue, maybe? Sixty yeah, percent comes from thrift store sales and the ladies work the thrift stores, uh, and that permits us not to be a government-aligned entity, and we provide counseling, medical assistance, dental assistance, education, GD programs, um, there's obviously hard work and discipline in the program. I can tell you what, if I was walking in there, I wouldn't want to do all that they make them do. I mean, it's a tough program. It's really hard. There's a lot of rules, and you got to keep all the rules, and, and they're putting in, enforced discipline in the lives of these ladies. Maybe I'm a little too rebellious to want to do it, but uh, it's a tough program. It lasts for at least nine months, and some of the ladies uh, elect to stay on. They'll stay on in staff or help. And then finally, the goal is really to, to impart hope into individuals who have been heretofore hopeless. Now, I want to shift my last portion of my talk and tell you this, and, and, and I'm saving the best for last, and that is when you've been faced with the loss of a son or a daughter from an overdose or a suicide, what can you do to redeem that? Well, some people would say you can't redeem it. You can't replace them. And, you know, I, I'll give you this anecdote. I was doing some podcasts. Some, there was a group that was doing a, a, a podcast uh, of inventors. And so they were interviewing me about inventing a new class of drugs. And, and they said, well, isn't it just outstanding that, you know, you've invented this class of medicines that helps people with anxiety and it could have helped your son. And, don't you feel wonderful about achieving that? And I just said, you have no idea what I feel like. I would much rather have my son than any of those achievements, any accolades, any gratitude, or the opportunity to be on your podcast. No, you don't get it. It's like, no, I want my son back. But we can be very intentional, and that is we can take the high ground. We can stay down in the valley, down in the pit of despair and say, woe is me, and go to our grave going, licking my wounds, I lost a son. Some, some parents choose that, okay? I didn't. I said, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a difference. So I'm going to give you examples of things I've chosen to do to make a difference. Um, one of the things I've done is I've written two books. The one that's on the left, Pain Taught Me to Love, the first chapter is the eulogy I delivered of my son a few days after he died of, of a fentanyl overdose. The book is free. Anybody who wants a copy can have one as you leave the room today. Um, and this book, Hope When Everything Seemed Hopeless, predated it. And the foreword in that book is to my son because of his mental health struggles. I mentioned I've also, as a scientist and inventor, I've invented a new class of drugs to replace addictive benzodiazepines. It's called Panex. I've got four patents issued on this, and I've sold it to a drug company, and the goal is to get this approved by the FDA and out there um, to replace Xanax and Clonopin as a safer alternative. And um, so keep your eyes peeled for that. So... What are the kinds of things I've done? I mentioned here, invented a new class of drugs using my professional skills as a redemptive act. I've written two books. I've told you a bit about teaching the ladies at the Love Lady Center. And for the first year after my son died, the only joy I had in my life, I, I mean this, the only joy I had was Monday afternoons I would go in there and I would teach those ladies, and while I was in front of them teaching, I had just a, a hint of joy because I could see there was some hope being imparted to them. And it helped sustain me. So the Love Lady Center helped me process my own grief. My wife had a very different tact. My wife, to this, to this date, uh, six years later, has only set foot in the building two times. And her approach was very different. Her timeline was different. Um, her framework was different. Mine was just, I got a problem, let's go solve a problem. 
And then lastly, I want to tell you this, and I'll finish here. Mercy for an incarcerated pen pal. There's a guy who is, turned 29 years old. His name is Aaron Shamo. And Aaron Shamo was an importer of fentanyl from China. And he was processing and making pills in his house in Utah and making millions of dollars selling fentanyl pills all over the dark web, all over the United States. And the Department of Justice rang me up and they said, hey, Dr. Dooley, we would really like for you um, to write a victim impact statement of the cost of the fentanyl crisis because they had heard of me speaking in Washington, D.C. and said, would you, would you do this? And then they surprised me and they said, by the way, this guy sold to your son. So I thought about it and I went, yeah, I will do that. And so I wrote a letter to the Department of Justice for his sentencing hearing. And I wrote two sections. The first section was just like all the facts about my son's life and his mental health struggles and his difficulties and, and that I was fully aware that he was buying fentanyl products on the dark web, AKA you, Aaron Shamo, you, I knew this. And then I got to the end and I said, but I also want you to know, I want you to live a life of hope even though you're being sentenced to life without parole at age 30. You're gonna go spend the rest of your life in prison. And so I expressed hope to him and I said, I forgive you and I want you to be blessed. Now, not many dads could do that, not many moms could do that but it was what I was led to do, and I sent it in. Um, at the sentencing trial, the judge contacted me and said, we had solicited, this, this young man was responsible for at least 100 deaths, and three of them could be proven to be his product. And uh, so he's got a life sentence, and he said, but we've selected three victim impact statements for his sentencing trial, yours is one of them. And the judge said, we've chosen yours because you're the only dad who showed this kid any mercy. He said, we wanted some mercy in there. So I'll end with this by telling you that uh, I've now written and received uh, letters as a pen pal with Aaron Shamo. And I'm trying to love him into life. And I'm trying to tell him, your life isn't over. You may have a life sentence. You may have done something really horrible, but I keep encouraging him to find something that you're really excellent at and learn it and become a master of it while you're in prison. And uh, it's not too late. I'm mindful of Psalm 71 that says this, but as for me, I shall always have hope. Thank you. much that's wonderful um the during our program in here at the booth um one of the things we wanted to do was um let women have the women from the love lady center tell their stories and um and some of the artists have but with our focus on the family tonight we wanted uh, we invited a local mother and daughter team to talk and i would like to introduce them um, Carrie Schugert is the Director of Operations at the ARENA. The ARENA is a recovery community organization located here in Bartow County in their new building at 109 Stonewall Street. And I'm going to ask Carrie and her mother to come and uh, have a seat, and I have a few questions for them. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'm going to start with you, Carrie. Um, 
Would you please introduce your mom and would you also tell us a little bit about your story? Sure, um, thank you for having us. Um, is that me? Um, thank you for having us. Thank you, Dr. Dooley, for that information. I personally related to so much of it. It explained a lot of my story. Um, but like Lisa said, my name is Carrie Sugar, and I'm a person in long-term recovery. And what that means for me is that on July 10th of this year, it'll have been four years since I've used any <laughs> since I've used any substances to change the way I feel physically, mentally, emotionally, and I also say spiritually because for me, that spiritual component was uh, it was such a huge part um, of my recovery journey. Because of my recovery, I get to talk to you about the, the peace and the joy that I have today. I get to be a wife and a mother and, and be a part of an amazing family that is alive with joy and goofiness and, and peace. And I am, uh, I like to think I'm a contributing member of the community. I'm giving back and trying to share um, the goodness of what hope is or, or what recovery is to me. And without my recovery, without the support of my family, none of this would be possible. Um, I, I was just briefly, I was talking to somebody the other day and I'm living dreams. These are dreams come true in my life um, because of my struggle, but because of my recovery. And that's, that's all what most people in recovery are doing. We're, uh, we're living out dreams and fulfilling, you know, amazing, amazing things in our life. So thank you, Mama, for being here tonight. Um, my mother is Sue Colston. She is the mother to three phenomenal daughters. Um, and no, she's, she's a good mama. She's always been my best friend and my support. Um, I'll let you just tell a little bit about yourself. I could never, never do it all. Okay. Well, I, I am a mother. Uh, that's been the greatest joy in my life. Um, I'm an RN almost 50 years, which is crazy of being a registered nurse, but I'm have a 20 year history of being a licensed professional counselor as well. And I was telling Dr. Dooley that I work in palliative care, palliative care services at Floyd Hospital in Rome. And unfortunately we are seeing young people come in on ventilators and to be on life support for the rest of their life or don't make it. So that's professionally one of the things that, that I've seen. But as, as a mom, um, and as an individual that grew up in a in a home that was loving, but yet very distant in communication and history of generational mental health issues, depression, trauma, abuse, um, you learn not to talk. You learn to just push things down. So I grew up with an eating disorder for a long time, kept it very much a secret. Um, and that's a sneaky disease because you can keep it a secret for a long time. But I was not healthy growing up. And when I had Carrie, um, I was not healthy either and did not know things. I never wanted to pass on a lot of behaviors and issues and problems, but I did because I had not done the work, nor known how to do the work, even though I was in, in the profession of helping too. So I think Carrie has, and other members in our family, we have had suicide, we have had mental health problems. I think the biggest thing in talking with Carrie is about, I think the problem in our relationship was a lot of codependency uh, we did see, I saw her as my best friend and my savior as a single mom. And that was a major problem that's too much for a child uh, to bear. So there's a lot of expectations that aren't even said, but you develop those self-expectations. And so it's, that's the repeat of the generational problems. And so, I, you know, I saw Carrie 
uh, as I had mental health problems, depression and anxiety. I kept that much to myself. And I saw Carrie begin to have as a young adult and a, a teenager to, to have those problems as well. Sue, so, could I ask, um, when did you first suspect that, that Carrie had a, a substance abuse problem? Well, that's, that's part of the mental health issue, I think, is that was what I thought was a major problem. Carrie has, and I'll let Carrie speak about this, but she's had major chronic orthopedic problems and hip replacements and has had chronic pain, but I thought all along much of her problem of focus on, focusing on pain relief and sadness and depression was related to mental health. I didn't see it as an addiction problem. Okay. Maybe that's something you can ask Carrie about. When, when did you, Carrie, when did you realize you needed help? I realized I needed help long before I actually got help. I think that's, that's a... Uh, can I ask roughly how many years? Um, so I think in, as my uh, chronic issues progressed. I became a pain, pain management patient back in 2011, but had been on some sort of opiate since 2007 from my first hip replacement. Um, by 2015, I knew that there was a problem. I knew that I couldn't stop, and I knew that it was not good, but um, it wasn't wasn't enough to to make me get help it wasn't enough to um to propel me to make that change or interrupt my life um because it it fulfilled a need it it, it managed my pain not only physically but mentally emotionally and spiritually and i think that i was the perfect storm waiting uh you know the the, the chronic pain or the pain management um avenue into this but I had this perfect storm waiting and so it all seemed to get better when I took opiates and and it worked at first and then until it didn't until it took over every aspect of my life and I didn't have a choice anymore and it was about keeping from getting sick and being miserable it wasn't about getting high I don't think it was ever about get, getting high but it was it was a um a response to pain, whether physical, mental, emotional. Um, Sue, how has Carrie's substance use disorder affected your relationship with her? Well, like I said, I think a lot of my um, observation and what I believe was a basis in mental health as the major problem, and I think a lot of it was maybe denial that this was, you know, as a nurse, I knew she had chronic problems and, and, and chronic pain. And that, that is a hard thing to separate the difference between that when it, when it is necessary. And unfortunately, fractures and things like that, medical problems do exist. And that is a very difficult thing to treat. But I think I felt, I just saw a hopelessness in her with depression, uh, isolation, um, always seeing that, or s seeing that she felt like she was always sick. There was always something wrong. And that was difficult. That's difficult to be around and I couldn't help her. There's a lot of helplessness. And I think, you know, during that time, steps were taken in, in my mental health and learning how to cope and understanding what my issues were and learning that I had enabled her in many situations. I had um, kept my mouth shut a lot of times when I saw things that weren't okay, um, but, but just a lot of sadness and helplessness. Um, and, and I think the, the struggles that we have, like Carrie was saying, is it is a physical, emotional, and spiritual battle. We have a strong, we, I, I've taught my girls and I grew up with a, a strong spiritual background. 
and you're praying for your child to get better and you see continued pain and that is really hopelessness but at the same time there's a I think the thing that has helped me is knowing that as much as I love Carrie God loves her more and he created her and he belongs to her. Now, that I have to admit, there were times when, and I, we talked not long ago about preparing for this talk, and we probably talked about some things that we had never talked about. And I told her that there was part of me at times, I pray God would take you because you were so miserable. And I knew you were. And it, it, it is awful to see that. But I think Carrie and God had work to do. And I'll let you address that as things began to change. But I had to realize I had to let go. I could not control this. I could pray. When I couldn't, when, that's the number one thing to do in my book. That's the first thing. So Carrie, um, with your with your recovery, with the, and with your mom letting go, letting God, uh, then how has your relationship changed with her? How is your relationship today with your mom? I think we are able to be honest, to be genuine, to be authentic, and and be okay with that, and um, not have to be each other's savior not have to rescue each other and know that that each of us independently have a relationship with our God that supersedes anything we can do for each other. Um, we have always laughed. We started out as best friends and we're going to end as best friends. And we laugh and there's just, there's peace. There's, I know 100% I am my most genuine version of myself that I've ever been in my entire life. And and I'm great with that. And I know that that's all you want me to be. Mm-hmm. You know, that's all you wanted me to be was whatever Carrie was. Mm-hmm. Not these, you know, um, unrealistic expectations I had, mm-hmm. you know, come up with myself. Um, but, but, yeah, so we have an honesty. We can talk. We can be okay to be disappointed in each other and know we're still going to be okay and that pain and discomfort is an it's a it's an emotion that it's okay to feel you know we've learned resilience from that so there's just that freedom that peace that joy and that hasn't been an easy road and i you know i having regrets gosh if we could change things and go back and do the the what ifs and should have would have and could have and all of that we're, Had um, we not gone through the 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 war <laughs> and the wars, we would not be here today. Definitely. I hate it. I wish I had learned earlier. I know you do too. But coming out, realizing what we have been through and learning from it has brought us here. Well, it makes it that much more precious. Yes. And we protect it. Absolutely. We're about out of time, or we're running. We could talk a about bit. it all night. <laughs> but I, I was just going to ask, um, you know, best advice, um, Sue. Is there anything you'd recommend to families struggling with addiction today? What would be your your main point? I think the biggest thing is, you know, getting help. You can't make someone else get help, but you can get help. So you do the work. You know, you take responsibility for yourself and do what you need to do to get better. Keep the prayers going that that person will get the help they need. I think that's the biggest thing. And then, Carrie, um, what are what are ways families can receive hope and encouragement here um, and support here in Bartow? So I think telling stories out loud, this is how we heal, and this is how we find hope and support is telling our stories out loud. And not everybody is comfortable to, to do that, but, but uh, finding that spirituality in your life, that thing that is bigger than you, that, 
that inspires you and 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 gives you strength and a foundation um you know finding a support network whether it is biological family or chosen family or friends uh support groups like Al-Anon or we're actually about to start a family support group at the arena um this month on the 20th 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 at um at 6 or 6:30 I think um 6:30 um but the first time I ever went to a meeting when I went to treatment I heard somebody tell part of his story and he said I I never felt like I fit in and I, ne- I always felt like I was trying to be this or that and the first meeting I ever walked into I realized those are my people and so I I experienced the same thing is is people in the recovery community which is so important to me we are each other's strength we are how we learn healthier coping skills and and ways to cope so uh finding support 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 all right i'd I'd like to thank our our speakers for coming this evening and sharing these messages with us i don't i don't know about y'all but i've been certainly impacted um, by this and this programming and thanks to john and beverly for bringing the exhibit to us and making all this all this possible and i guess if i could ask anything is that everybody leave here with hope in their hearts this evening and please say thank you to our guests thank you you all all right